Uh, there's some seating up along uh, the edges here and also in the balcony, so come on in. I uh, hope everyone had a great block break, whatever you were up to, and I'm just thrilled that so many people are here to help join in welcoming Mr. Wade Davis, Explorer in Residence at National Geographic. Let's give him a big hand. Um, my name's Bretton Schwarzenbach. I'm a senior studio art major um, who is a winter start. And, woo! and I, took, I took the fall semester off, as you guys know, um, before coming here. And a dear older friend of mine gave me a copy of Wade's book, The Wayfinders, Why Ancient Wisdom Mo Matters in the Modern World. Consequently, the title of today's talk she said I might like it, and I did. <laughs> and that book really shattered, in the brief span that I read it, my previous understanding of what it meant to be human, living, and thinking in relation to our planet. And sparked, at least in me, a personal desire to try and understand some of the diverse and myriad ways that human beings live and have lived for thousands of years. And so, kind of as a result of reading some of Wade's work and having traveled on my own in parts of northern India, I went back um, with support from faculty and some grants here at Colorado College to live with a group of nomadic herders along the Tibet border to try and understand a tension between a globalizing world and, and this tremendous past rooted um, in a very sacred relationship to a very particular geography. And I just became really fascinated by that and I'm very thankful to CC for having provided that opportunity. And I mention that simply because as Colorado College students, we have the immense opportunity and capacity to engage the world in diversely creative, innovative, and meaningful ways, however that may manifest. And for those reasons, I think that Wade is a kindred spirit to many of us in this room, at this college, in this community, and that his thoughts, his insights, and his stories have the capacity to really transform the way that we value our planet's diversity at a time when it is changing at an increasingly rapid rate. Um, so now I'd really love to extend a big thank you to everyone who is streaming this event, President Jill Tiefenthaler, who cannot be with us today, and most extraordinarily, recent alum, Mr. Benjamin Sandelow, who informed me last night that he would be streaming this event live somewhere along the western coast of India in between, regardless of the time difference, somewhere um, in between this rigorous study of Vedic philosophy in the free-spirited fashion that he embodies, if you know what I'm talking about. So let's... <laughs> I'd really love it if on three we could give Ben a big hello. He's out there watching from who knows where, but I'm pretty sure he's watching. So on three, I'd really love it if we could make his day with a big hello, Ben. Is everyone ready? Yeah. All right, one, two, three. Hello, Ben. That's great. Um, and, and thank you, Ben. And thank you to everyone who has helped make this possible. Um, sponsors kind of across the board, geology, anthropology, the president's office, the dean's fund, um, CCSGA. It's kind of a patchwork uh, fundraising effort to bring Wade here. Um, but thank you to everyone who has helped in that process, and most importantly, thank you to Wade. And now, Professor of Anthropology, Sarah Houtsinger, will continue with his introduction. Thanks a lot. Good morning. First of all, I want to extend our, all of our thanks to Breton Schwarzenbach. I think most of us have only the slimmest notion of what is involved in this endeavor, and his leadership and all the work he's done is really appreciated. So thanks, Breton. I 
I think that Colorado College is extremely fortunate to be able to count Dr. Wade Davis as part of the Colorado College family. He is the parent of a recent alumna. He has received an honorary degree and given a commencement speech. And every time he's come to my class, including this morning, I think the students have not failed to be jolted into a sense of, um, of urgency because this is a man who speaks with a kind of power and poetry about the richness of the human fabric and human diversity and human knowledge, both all that we have chosen and gained through millennia, but also that which we stand to, to not preserve or continue to count as part of our human patrimony. So we're very fortunate. There are stories we could tell, but I couldn't think of any that were quite the right combination of funny and embarrassing to merit my time up here, so we'll see if he can bring any up. Um, Dr. Wade Davis has been described as a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. His work is vast and visionary. He's an explorer in residence for a National Geographic Society, and that work has taken him, get this list, to East Africa, Borneo, Nepal, Peru, Polynesia, Tibet, Mali, Benin, Papua New Guinea, Australia, Colombia, Vanuatu, Mongolia, and the high Arctic of Nunavut and Greenland, and to our own backyard along the Colorado River. Wade is from the forests of British Columbia. He holds degrees in anthropology and biology um, and a PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. Through the Harvard Botanical Museum, he spent more than three years as a plant explorer living in the Andes and the Amazon among 15 different indigenous groups in eight different countries while recording some 6,000 uh, um, botanical collections. His work his dissertation work, in fact, took him to Haiti to investigate the faith of Udun and to explore what the ethnobotanical compounds behind the creation of zombies were, and that turned into an internationally renowned book, The Serpent and the Rainbow, published in 1986. Subsequently, he's published a total of 17 books. Those include Penan, Voice for the Borneo Rainforest, One River, the Wayfinders, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World, and most recently, Into the Silence, The Great War, Mallory, and the Conquest of Everest. Among numerous awards that he's received, we include the Explorers Medal, the highest award of the Explorers Club, the Gold Medal of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, the 2002 Lowell's Thomas Medal, the Lenin Prize for Literary Nonfiction, the David Fairchild Medal for Botanical Exploration, and the 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize, the most prestigious award for literary nonfiction in the English language. All that being said, please join me in a warm welcome for Wade Davis. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thanks, Brett. And I mean, he, he's a wonderful kid, and he, one thing he certainly is is persistent. Uh, <laughs> He was after me for months to make this happen, and we really, I'm so grateful to have finally met him. Um, it's a joy to be back at CC. Uh, uh, many of you may remember my daughter, Tara, uh, who is now living with the drummer of her band uh, at CC. They were pretty good. They won the Battle of the Bands a lot, and um, she's a lot more charismatic than I am, I can promise you. It's a joy to be back with all of you. I think I've lectured at over 300 American universities, but there's only one CC, and it's the greatest college in the country. And I really mean that. At any rate, I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, one of the, the great pleasures of travel, uh, as many of you probably have already experienced, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways who still feel the past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still 
resonate with meaning. Or that in the high Himalaya, the Buddhist still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology, and that is the idea that the world into which you were born, your particular culture, does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it's a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder on the slopes of Shomalungma, Mount Everest, an eagle hunter of central Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof nomad of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And that's an idea that, if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of cultures ar around the world make up this sort of intellectual, social, spiritual web of life that envelops the planet and is surely as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And in an early book, I, termed, I coined the term ethnosphere to kind of create an organizing principle for this realm of cultural um, patrimony. And I define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuitions, myths and memories brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The, the ethnosphere in this sense is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and imaginative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so is the ethnosphere, but if anything, of course, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that half of all plants and animals are on the brink of extinction because it simply is not the case. But that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of this, of course, is language loss. When each of you were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language I once wrote is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day you were born, Today, fully half aren't being taught to children, which means they're effectively they're on the brink of extinction. Now, there are many people who say, wait a minute, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my, my answer to that is always to say, what a great idea. But let's make that universal language a nuptitak. Let's make it Yoruba. Let's make it San. Let's make it Lakota. And suddenly you begin to feel, uh, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. Yet that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody somewhere on earth roughly every two weeks. Because on average, every fortnight, some elder passes away and carries with them into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And the reason, reason that this is so particularly poignant at this moment in history is that it's transpiring just as the geneticists have finally proven it to be true what the anthropologists and the philosophers, for that matter, have always hoped to be true. And that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that race is an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. The human genetic endowment of humanity is a single continuum. And what this means, therefore, is that every population, by definition, has the same raw human genius, the same mental acuity, the same basic potential. And whether this genius is expressed through technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement in the West, or by contrast, invested in 
unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no progression in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea that we went somehow from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the strand in London, that there was a sort of ladder to success that plopped ourselves at the apex of a pyramid that sloped down to the so-called primitives of the world has been thoroughly debunked and discredited by modern science and is shown to be as much an artifact of 19th century thinking as the idea, for example, that clergymen had in that era that the earth was but 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the human spirit, science has proven it to be true, this essential interconnectedness of humanity. Not only that, but we know for a scientific fact where the Garden of Eden is, or was. We know that we all walked out of Africa some 70,000 years ago, or at least a good number of us. And in doing so, we embarked on this extraordinary diaspora, 2,500 generations in, in length and duration, chronologically, a, a, a kind of a hegira that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But what all of this means is that the other cultures of the world most assuredly are not failed attempts to be you. They're not failed attempts to be modern. Quite to the contrary, each culture on earth is a fundamental answer, is an answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when all the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices, and those voices collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the ensuing millennia. But the challenge then comes, what do you do about this? You know, um, when I was recruited to the National Geographic 12 years ago, I was given the rather bold assignment of trying to change the way the world views and values culture within a decade. The challenge was that if you, for example, as a biologist, if you identify an area of high species endemism, you can create a protected area, a national park, but you can't make a rainforest park of culture. Change is the one constant in the affairs of, of humanity. So what could we do about it? Well, recognizing that polemics are never persuasive and that politicians will never lead us anywhere, we thought at the National Geographic that storytellers, by contrast, are the very ones who change the world. And so what I decided to do was embark on a series of journeys to the ethnosphere, if you will, that would take the vast global audience of the National Geographic, roughly 300 million people around the world in multiple languages every month, and take that audience to places in the ethnosphere where the beliefs, practices, adaptations were so inherently dazzling that you couldn't help but come away from the exposure with... Uh, Having, without having embraced this kind of revelation of anthropology. And so, for example, we made a film that we called The Science of the Mind about Tibetan Buddhism. Why did we use that term science to describe what you think of as a religion? Well, what is science, after all, but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as to the nature of mind? A lama once said to me that Western science is too often a major response to minor needs. He said, you in the West spend all of your lifetimes trying to live to be a hundred without losing your teeth. Uh, we in Tibet spend our lifetimes trying to understand the nature of consciousness, the nature of life itself. He said that your, your billboards in New York celebrate naked teenagers in underwear. Our billboards are many walls of prayers for the well-being of all sentient creatures. Now, so let's begin on a kind of journey around the world to some of these points in the ethnosphere. And let's begin with the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. And that, of course, is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung upon the southern seas. And in 1905, I was very, in, in 2005, rather, I was very fortunate. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like 1905, <laughs> believe me. In 2005, I was really fortunate to be invited by the Polynesian Voyaging Society to join them on um, a, an expedition on board the Hokulea, this catamaran, this sacred canoe, constructed based on the drawings that Joseph Banks put in his journal when he sailed across the Pacific with 
uh, Captain Cook in the late 18th century, the Hokale is named for the sacred star of Hawaii. And even today, the sailors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society can name 350 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same perspicacity with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull of the vessel, can distinguish as many as five sea swells moving through the canoe at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most amazing thing about this tradition is that it's all based on dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning means that you only know where you are by remembering precisely all the steps by which you got there. Now, it was a very impossibility of using dead, dead reckoning on a major oceanic voyage that kept most European transports hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians from an ancient civilization off the shores of New Guinea that we call Lapita set sail into the rising sun. In a thousand years, they reached Samoa and Tonga, and then they waited for 10 centuries. And then the movement began again, 4,000 kilometers across the Central Pacific through the Cook Islands, the Society Islands, to the Marquesas. And then northwest back to Hawaii, southeast 6,000 miles to Rapa Nui, or Easter Island. And then finally, around the time of the First Crusade, they made landfall in what we now call New Zealand. And all of this implied that the wayfinder, sitting monk-like on the stern of the vessel, open to the wind and the sun and the stars, had to remember in his or her mind every shift of wind, every angle by which the vessel turned into the dawn, the sightings of all the stars, even the scent of the water as they moved across the Pacific. And, and doing so in a tradition that lacked the written word, so everything had to be committed to memory. The Polynesian Voyaging Society, led by my good friend Nainoa Thompson, and the other wonderful thing about this tradition is the metaphor is that the vessel itself never moves. The vessel is the axis mundi of existence. It is, the, it is a symbol of civilization. And so the navigator is said to actually conjure the islands out of the water. So you, the phrase they use is to pull an island out of the sea. And so Nainoa decided to pull Rapa Nui out of the sea, sailing from Oahu. This implied a journey of 6,000 miles, tacking into the wind for 2,500 miles, all to reach an island that was but 23 kilometers across, less than a degree on a compass, had a compass been on board the vessel. But there are no modern navigational aids on the Hokalea, just the ancient skills of the wayfinder and the heart and soul of a people for whom their entire cultural survival and revitalization is based on the power and the metaphor of this incredible vessel, Hokalea. So if we move now from the greatest ocean sphere, let's enter the greatest forest. And that, of course, is the Amazon, a forest the size of the continental United States, or more poetically put, the size of the face of the full moon. And you enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda in the northwest Amazon of Colombia, an expanse of forest the size of France, a people who live so closely to that forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. A people who believe that they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of the sacred serpents only to be regurgitated onto the banks of the various affluents of the northwest Amazon. Or if we slip down the flank of the Cordillera into one of the most remarkable cultures I ever lived with, these are the notorious Warani, um, known to all outsiders as Auka, 
a pejorative term in Quechua that meant savage. The Waldani were a remarkable people in good measure because they were living but 150 miles from Quito, capital of Ecuador, a city that had been settled for 400 years, and yet they lived in total isolation and first contact did not occur until 1958, fully five years after I was born. In 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs of themselves and what we would say culturally to be friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to try to find the form to the figure, found nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, which indeed they were, and they promptly speared the missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders, we traced genealogies back eight generations and found only two cases of natural death. And when we pressured them a little bit about it, here Kue, the jaguar shaman, said that, um, uh, that uh, one of the men had died, gotten so old that he died getting old, so he speared him anyway. But 54% of their mortality was due to them spearing each other. But they had a kind of perspicacious knowledge of the forest that was amazing. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life had left that behind. Again, not because they were sauvage in some kind of Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who had examined that forest homeland with such intensity because it was upon that forest homeland that their lives depended. And it's exactly that knowledge that drew us into the Amazon as botanical explorers. You know, I was very fortunate when I was an undergraduate at Harvard to fall into the orbit of a legendary botanical explorer by the name of Richard Evans Schultes, the man who had sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. Uh, in time, mountains would bear his name in South America, as would national parks. He was an odd choice to become a 60s icon, which he indeed was, because his politics were wildly conservative. He didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, he was such an Anglophile that one of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. Uh, so I didn't know any of this history when at the age of 18 I rapped on his fourth floor Erie and I got as far as the adjective British, as in, sir, I'm from British Columbia, I've saved up money in a logging camp, and I want to go to the Amazon like you did and collect plants. And all it took was that adjective. Uh, and he looked across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals. He asked none of my credentials, of which there were none. And he said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon, where I stayed for 15 months. And just before leaving his office, he says, never forget that the difference between a poison hallucinogen and a medicine is just dosage. And so, so he, he encouraged us to be on the outlook for any biodynamic plants which might have alkaloids that of course could be manipulated and perhaps even introduced into modern medicine. Plants like this one, the flying death, the curare, the arrow and dart poison, so well known to all of you. But of course these poisons contain a muscle relaxant d 2 curare, which uh, revolutionized modern surgery when it was introduced into the 19, in the 1940s, again, as a muscle relaxant. And this kind of research led invariably into the realm of the shaman. And if you follow the great writings of the ethnographers such as Shirley MacLaine, uh, you'd think that shaman are these sort of benign grandfather figures with feathers and bells who sing a lot. Um, I've been with a lot of shaman, and I've never been with one who wasn't psychotic. I mean, that's their job. I mean, they're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. They're the ones who go into these metaphysical spaces that most people are happy to avoid as they raise their children. And the essence of the shamanic art of healing is a notion of the nature of health and well-being and the nature of disease, it's profoundly different. Disease is not defined as the presence of pathogens, but rather as a state of imbalance in which the physical and spiritual components of the individual do not find their proper rest. So the essential act of shamanic healing is a metaphysical act in which the shaman must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance to get into those distant metaphysical realms where he or she can work their deeds of magical, mystical, 
medical rescue. And that accounts for one of the most curious anomalies in botanical science, and that is that of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, fully 95% are found in the Americas or Siberia, not because the forests of equatorial West Africa are depauperate, but simply because people there have other avenues to the divine. But in the Americas in particular, the route to the Godhead is facilitated by these plant medicines, such as this one, Ebene, the semen of the sun, in a photograph that Schultes took when he discovered it in the 1950s while living amongst the Yanomami. These powders are derived from the blood red resin of several species in the genus Varola in the nutmeg family. They're chock full of powerful psychoactive agents, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine. To have these powders blown up your nose is rather like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. It, create, it creates not the distortion of reality, as mushrooms do, it creates the absolute disillusion of reality. In fact, I used to argue with Professor Schultes that you couldn't classify this as being a hallucinogen because by the time you're under the influence, there was no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. <laughs> but we're not interested in these plants simply because of their dazzling pharmacological effects, but more profoundly, what they tell us about a different way of knowing. Now, they, those powders are blown, blown, blown up the nose for a very specific reason. Tryptamines, of which brain serotonin is one, are orally inactive. You could swallow as much of that powder as you wanted, and nothing would happen, because the tryptamines are denatured by an enzyme found naturally in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction of some, with some other chemical that denatures the MAO in the human gut. Now, the main preparation of which you are no doubt aware of the Northwest Amazon is kind of almost an underground cult in America now, and not so underground anymore. And this, of course, is ayahuasca, the vision vine, the vine of the soul. Now, ayahuasca is not a plant, but a combination of plants. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family, the genus Psychotria, Psychotria viridis, leaves that are chock full of the tryptamines, and the woody bark of a liana, which has beta carbolines harming and harmling, which turn out to be MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamine. So here's the interesting question. How, in a flora of 80,000 species of vascular plants, did the native people learn to combine these morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest to create this powerful synergistic effect, a biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts? Now, the only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is quickly exposed as being a meaningless euphemism. You ask the native people, and they look at you as if you were a fool, knowing nothing about plants, because they say, in the case of the Siona sequoia, they have 17 different varieties of that woody liana, all of which would be referable to my Harvard-trained taxonomic eye as being the same species, Banisteriopsis capi, and when you ask them the nature of their classification, the answer is rather poetic. They say you take each one of the 17 on the night of a full moon, and each one sings to you in a different key. Now, that's not get, going to get you a PhD in plant systematics at University of Colorado, but it's a hell of a lot more interesting than counting flower parts. But it also speaks about a different way of knowing. And the reason this is so important is because our knowledge of the Amazon is utterly embryonic. When I was your age, the old um, adage about the Amazon was that it was a, a counterfeit paradise, a, a kind of a castle of immense biological sophistication built on a foundation of sand. And when you remove the canopy, you set in motion this chain reaction of biological destruction of terrible consequences. And that was true to a certain extent, but it implied a uniformity to the Amazon basin that 50 years of support. And in fact, when applied to a landmass seven times the size of Ontario, it became as much slogan as it was science. And, but it fit into our idea of how fragile the Amazon was, which of course was of great concern with the rate of deforestation, but more importantly, it fit into our idea of what it meant to live in the Amazon as a native person. 
And that was simply because our encounters with indigenous people had been limited really to the encounters with tribes like the Warani living along the flanks of the eastern flank of the Amazon, uh, the Andean Cordillera, isolated from the east by cataracts and geography, from the west by the Andes that weren't traversed till the 1940s. And these tended to be small societies, endogenous, uh, living in open conflict with their neighbors. And that became our image of what it was to be a person in the Amazon, in a sense. But what about Aureliana in 1541, when he sailed down the length of the Amazon, and the chronicler who was with him described not an empty forest, but a forest filled with tens of millions of people? Well, of course, that's what the Amazon was. And it was when the diseases arrived within the wake of contact that that demographic collapse occurred. So decimate is not the right word because decimate means to kill one in 10 European diseases swept away 90% of the American Indian civilizations from Tierra del Fuego to the Canadian Arctic. The question has always been, is there a place in the Amazon where the voices of those ancient civilizations can still be heard? we now know that there is in the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, who have social structures that facilitate peace, not war, and trade, not um, conflict, uh, not the least of which is a marriage rule that says you must marry someone who speaks a different language. So in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply wait, watch, and listen and one day begin to speak. They live in these vast longhouses, practically the size of this room, which in their architectural sophistication and their, and their symbolic resonance are equivalent to anything the Maya or the Inca ever built. They were simply made of plant materials which did not survive. And this is a set of cultures that were on the very brink of extinction in the 1970s. And and in fact, a friend of mine made a film called Disappearing Worlds for the BBC, and he had lived with these people, and, and we all thought these cultures were going to disappear. And I, when he came back in 2009, head of the anthropology at Cambridge University, to help me make this film, he walked into the Maloka halfway through our, our, our project, and it was filled with 250 men in full ritual regalia, all taking ayahuasca for three days and three nights. And he couldn't believe his eyes. And he, he, he got on the satellite phone to his wife, who had been with him in 68 in the forest. And he said, Christine, she was back in London, you won't believe what I'm seeing. The only thing that disappeared are the fucking missionaries. <laughs> and, and people are always asking me, is this a one-way road to extinction? No. What happened here is that an enlightened Colombian president by the name of Virgilio Barco said to a friend of mine, Martin von Hildebrand, do something for the Indians. And as head of Indian affairs, Martin in five years did more than something. He secured legal land tenure to an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities in the northwest Amazon of Colombia. And behind the veil of isolation created by the troubles of modern Colombia, a new dream of culture was reborn. We came this far from losing the voices of the very culture that could tell us what it was like, in a sense, at the time of contact. But more importantly, we've now discovered that their entire cosmologies and mythologies amount to nothing more or less than a very sophisticated land management plan that says exactly how people in vast numbers can live in the Amazon. When I asked an elder why they had tolerated the missionaries in their midst, he said to me something very powerful. He said, because they promised they would make us human. And this is a moment of contact, you see. There are three questions in life. Who am I, where do I come from, where am I going? And when contact happened, the missionaries said to all these indigenous people that the answers they had had for all of those questions, not only now, but for all of their history, had been wrong. Now, before I left Harvard the very first time, Schultes also told me I should look up his man in Columbia, his protege, Timothy Plowman, for whom he had done really the impossible. He had secured the dream academic grant of the 1970s, a quarter million dollars and a brand new red Dodge Power Wagon four-wheel drive pickup truck to study a plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality. And this, of course, was coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And it was an astonishing assignment because even though the efforts to eradicate the fields had been underway for 50 years, and even though cocaine was beginning to be a problem in the streets of American cities, 
Very little was known about the source plant, even though the drug itself, cocaine hydrochloride, remained our most important topical anesthetic for nose, throat, and ear surgery. We knew that in the time of the Inca, the plant was revered as no other. Unable to cultivate it at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, they replicated it in gold and silver leaf and fields that colored the horizon. We knew that even today in the Andes, no event could occur without some reciprocal exchange of the energy of the leaf to the apus, the deities that direct the destiny of every living being. We knew that no field could be harvested, no elder led into the realm of the dead, no child brought into the realm of the living without some kind of exchange of the sacred plant. And to the absolute horror of our backers of the US government, we did the first nutritional study of coca in 1975, and we found out that yes, it had a small amount of cocaine in it, roughly analogous to the amount of caffeine in a coffee bean, and nobody noticed the irony that at every drug abuse conference, all the narcs bolted for the coffee pot at 10 o'clock in the morning. But in addition to the small amount of alkaloid benignly absorbed through the mucous membrane of the mouth as a mild stimulant in a harsh environment, the plant was chock full of vitamins. It had more calcium in it than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that traditionally lacked a dairy product, particularly for young mothers. It also had enzymes in it which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, again a perfect supplement to a potato-based diet in the Andes. And so in one elegant scientific assay we put into stark profile the efforts that are underway to this day to eradicate the traditional fields, and we showed that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for 4,000 years by the people of the Andes. And so with coca as my lens, both metaphorically and literally, the rhythms of the Andes came into focus. And I became very interested in this notion of sacred geography. And again, not something derived from hippie ethnography, but what does it really mean for a people to believe that the earth is alive? That they have true and actual reciprocal obligations to the earth, just as the earth has obligations to people. I mean, I, for example, was raised in Canada to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock waiting to be mined. What about my godson in the community of Chinchero, just outside of Cusco, raised to believe that a mountain was an Apu spirit that would direct his destiny? Again, the interesting thing is not who's right and who's wrong. It's how the belief itself creates a consequence, particularly in terms of the ecological footprint of the respective culture. And this idea of the inherent sanctity of the earth, an idea that living in the Andes is so self-evident because the earth and the landscape is so dynamic and alive. Earthquakes, landslides, uh, a single frost that can in 10 minutes wipe out the agricultural labor of a, of, a, of a year. And so this relationship is constantly affirmed through ritual. And one of the most remarkable rituals I ever took place in, part in is called the Mojamiento. And once each year in this remarkably beautiful valley of Chinchero, site of the summer palace of Topa Inca Yupanqui, the second of the great Inca rulers, the fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And for one day, he places the clothing of his sister or his mother upon his body and is transformed into a transvestite known as a wailaka. And then leading all able-bodied men, he initiates a run. But it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet, you run down 2,000 feet to the base of the sacred mountain, and then you run to 16,000 feet, only to fall away to the sacred valley, and then to cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a 24-hour ordeal. The idea, of course, is that you go into the mountain as an individual, but through exhaustion and sacrifice, and remember that the word sacrifice comes from the Latin to make sacred, you emerge from the mountains as a single pulse, a community that once again has come together to reaffirm its place in the planet because the entire perimeter of the run is the perimeter of the community lands, a perimeter that's marked by holy mounds of earth where the wailaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountaintop where coca is given to Pachamama, libations of alcohol to the wind. And I participated in this event at the age of 48 and I was the only outsider ever to do so and the oldest man ever to do so and I only got through the race by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. <laughs> uh, 
But what really got me through it is that I had baptized children in that community for 30 years, and when all my godchildren, boys and girls, and I've been buying cows for all the families, found out that their padrino was stupid enough to run the movimiento at the age of 48, they came out to the village and clung to me throughout the day like limpets. Uh, they weren't about to let anything happen to their cash cow. But these localized events become Pan-Andean in these great festivals like the Coyariti, where once each year tens of thousands of native people from all of the Andes converge on a sacred uh, valley called the Sinicara in the shadow of Ausangati, the most important of all the sacred mountains of the Inca. And the, the event is a perfect expression of 500 years of Catholic faith on top of generations of pre-Columbian ideas. So the symbolism comes from Christianity, but it's all infused by the power of landscape in Pachamama. So what it, the essential act of the ritual is that the crosses from everybody's community are brought up to the ice and planted in the ice for 24 hours and then retrieved. Now these contemporary events can even unveil mysteries of such iconic places as Machu Picchu. Now many of you I'm sure have been to Machu Picchu and it was probably described to you as a lost city. It was only a lost city in the PR fantasies of the National Geographic. If you actually look around the site, you can see that it was connected to the network of royal roads, the 14,000 miles of roads that the Inca built in less than a century of the empire's existence. But more importantly, Machu Picchu is fused into archaic notions of sacred geography. This obelisk or this abstract carving, the Intihuatana, what Bingham called the hitching post to the sun, is the axis mundi of the site. But what it does is it shares the light. The light that falls upon it is always the light that falls upon the sacred Apu, the deity of Machu Picchu, which is the famous sugar loaf known as Huayna Picchu. If you come this side of the Intihuatana, you find an altar. If you go to the top of Huayna Picchu, you find a parallel altar. A direct bearing north to south goes right through the heart of the Intihuatana and then scores the skyline through the heart of Salcantay, sister mountain to Ausangati, the ice fields of which give the water to Machu Picchu, both literally and metaphysically. But when the Southern Cross is in the southernmost extent of the sky, enmeshed in the Milky Way, it too is in that sacred alignment. And the Milky Way is seen to be the heavenly equivalent of the river that flows around Machu Picchu, the Vilcabanota, or the Urubamba. But this is the river of life for the Incan Empire, but where is this river born? in the very snowfields of the Coyariti. So 500 years after Columbus, the people of the Andes are still celebrating these ancient notions of sacred geography. Now, if that's a sphere where you hear this marvelous syncretic fusion of the worlds that came together in that terrible moment of the conquest, there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice is heard unfettered. And that is in this extraordinary complex of societies the Wiwa, the Kankwano, the Arawakos, and the Kogi, known collectively as the Elder Brother. Descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization, which once carpeted the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia, in the wake of the conquest, they retreated into this isolated volcanic massif that soars to 20,000 feet right out of the Caribbean coastal plain. In a bloodstained continent, they alone were never conquered by the Spanish. And they may remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. And according to the great Colombian anthropologist Geraldo Reicheldomatov, who lived with them in the 1940s, the training for the priesthood is rather astonishing. The young boys are taken away from their families at the age of three, sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, two nine-year periods deliberately chosen to mimic the nine months of gestation in their natural mother's womb. Now they're in the womb of the great mother. And for that entire time, the world only exists as an abstraction as they're taught the values of their culture, which include the idea that their prayers alone uh, maintain the cosmic balance of the universe. And then after 18 years in which the lad has not seen a sunrise, has not seen the horizon, has not seen a mountain scrape the sky, he is suddenly taken out on a pilgrimage to the heart of the world. And the world is revealed to him in all of its glory. And the priest who has trained him says, you see, it's as I've told you all those years. It is that beautiful. It's yours to protect. Now this was almost a ethnographic fable because Reichel never saw one of those pilgrimages, just heard about them. And no one had ever seen it. And no one knew if this was really, it was almost too good to be true. And then a, a wonderful thing happened. This 
man, Danilo Villafania, walked into my office at the National Geographic with Carolina Barco, the Colombian ambassador, and he had three priests with him, mamos, who were barefoot in a winter day in Washington. And Danilo started to speak about some of their political concerns, and I interrupted him and I said, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but you look like an old friend of mine. And I showed him this photograph, and the man on the right is Alberto de Fania, who turned out to be Danilo's father, and, I, and who was murdered by the paramilitaries during the drug thing. And I said, Danilo, you may not remember me, but when you were a little baby boy, I carried you on my back for months up and down the mountains with your father. And based on this incredible serendipitous connection, and this boy on the left here, Eugenio, is now this revered elder, second from the left. Based on this connection, Danilo invited me to come with a film crew and accompany one of these journeys to the heart of the world. It was the most extraordinary thing. We discovered that at least today, the acolytes don't spend 18 years in the darkness, but they do spend 18 years in the environs of the sacred temple. Much of the time at night, around the fire, being enculturated into this extraordinary Baroque religious worldview that has led many people to describe them as the Tibetans, if you will, of South America. And then the journey begins, and it is a journey to the heart of the world. Every ripple in the landscape resonates with mythological significance. Even the sizal hats that the men wear are a conscious attempt to echo the snowfields found on Saranqua at the heart of the world. The metaphor in this culture is a loom. They say, upon this loom I weave my life. As they move up and down the mountain gradient, they describe their trajectories as threads, such that over the course of a lifetime, you weave a cloak over the body of Saranqua, the great goddess. When they pray, they move like this because their prayers are as threads being spun into the heavens. And we reach the penultimate point of the pilgrimage, and in these pilgrimages you begin by taking objects from the sea to the ice and from the ice to the sea to create that sacred cycle of the divine. And we reach the penultimate stage when we found all the mamos deep in meditation and prayer. And what had happened is the FARC, the leftist bandit guerrillas, the drug characters had come through the hamlet but an hour before and we just missed them and they were there to kidnap us. So we had to abandon all of our equipment hide out until dark, and I can't say you have a dramatic rescue on a, a mule, you kind of clip-clop your way to rescue, but it was an astonishing spectral night of a full moon and freezing cold, but the Arawakos led us up these narrow tracks in the cliff face, and as it turned out, we had arrived in the Sierra in the middle of a hornet's nest, an open firefight between the FARC and the Colombian army, but we just went, handed our cameras to the Arawako colleagues, they finished the film because we had trained them in cinematography, and we returned to the ocean side where even though the sacred sites today are dominated by construction, it doesn't stop the elder brother from doing what is their mission in life, the ritual prayers that maintain the balance of the world and the prayers that maintain the integrity of our own patrimony, the future of our dreams. And it's humbling to think that two hours from Miami Beach, as we sit here in Colorado Springs, the elder brother are actively praying for our well-being, and they speak in full sentences and full paragraphs of our need to change our relationship to the world. Well, I, as those who know me know, um, live by Marshall McLuhan's adage that if it works, it's obsolete. And the minute I get good at doing something, I want to do something else. And there was always a something lurking in Schulte's fourth floor eerie office and one wintry day in 1982, he summoned me there and asked me if I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies and securing the formula of a drug used to make zombies. Well, naturally I said yes, uh, thinking that it would consume a fortnight of my life, it ended up consuming four years of my life because something was made available to me the minute I entered the African reality that had really eluded me in all that time in the um, Andes and the Amazon. And that was truly a window wide open to the mystic. You know, it's interesting, were I to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Judaism, Hinduism, Ju Christianity, Buddhism, whatever, Islam, there's always one continent left out, the tacit assumption being that African people had no religious beliefs. Well, of course, by ethnographic definition, they did. And voodoo is not a black magic cult. It's simply a word from the font language of Dahomey that means spirit or God. 
And in many ways, it's a quintessentially democratic faith because a believer has direct access to the, the divine. Like all religion, it attempts to rationalize the relationship between the living and the dead and to cope with the irrevo irrevo irrevocable separation that death implies. And so a proper death in Africa is one in which the body slips into the ground, but the soul is captured by the, by the hugon or the priest or the mambo, the priestess, and placed into a vessel which is put into the sanctuary, the temple. In time, that spirit, initially associated with a particular ancestor, becomes part of the vast ancestral pool of energy out of which emerge the archetypes, the spirits of the pantheon. But in this quintessentially democratic faith, the dead must be made to serve the living. To serve the living, they must become manifest. To become manifest, they must respond to the rhythm of the drum, to come back to earth, to momentarily displace the soul of the living so that critically, for that brief shining moment, human being and God become one and the same. And that's the essence of spirit possession. It's not a moment of psychic breakdown. It's the hand of divine grace. And when you are taken by a God, you become the God and you cannot be harmed. And that's why you see these theatrical gestures cutting into the skin before a fetish in Dahomey or in Haiti, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance handling burning embers with impunity, a kind of a astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. And as it turned out, the, 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 the fear in Haiti is not of zombies, but of becoming a zombie. Zombification was the ultimate social sanction of the Bizango Champuel, the secret societies that are the most powerful arbiter of social and political life in Haiti. And there did exist a folk poison that could not make a zombie, because no poison can make any social phenomenon, but this poison most assuredly could make someone appear to be dead in such a way that it would fool a Western trained physician. So in that sense, I did uh, come to understand the nature of zombification, a phenomenon that's been used in an explicitly racist way to denigrate an entire people in their remarkable religion. And I did write this book, The Serpent and the Rainbow, that was made into the worst movie in Hollywood history. And Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in the Arizona state line, um, in, in Tucson rather, or you know, get to the California state line, throw your book over, and then go back to Tucson and have a drink. Um, I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forest of Borneo. Um, I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. You know, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful though they may be, are somehow destined to fade away, a kind of cold convenience to rationalize the cult of the modern, uh, as, if, as if, you know, they're, they're failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being us. Nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture, and all cultures are constantly changing, dancing with new possibilities for life. In every case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because it suggests that if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. And the reason I wanted to live with the Penan was because we were all once wanderers on a pristine planet. It was only 12,000 years ago that we succumbed, as Joseph Campbell said, to the cult of the seed and the poetry of the shaman became the prose of the organized priesthood. And nomadic societies are profoundly different. How, for example, do you measure wealth in a culture in which there's a disincentive to accumulate anything? Well, in this culture, wealth is defined as a strength of relationships between people, because if those relationships fray, everybody suffers. There's no word for thank you in the Penan language because everything is reflexively shared, because you never know who will be the next to bring food to the encampment. I once offered a cigarette to a little old lady and watched in my amazement as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to each hut in the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. And in these societies that lack the written word, there's a kind of a dialogue maintained with the natural world that's astonishing. I think it, in the same way that you can hear the voices of a character when you read a novel, so too hear the people hear the voices in some sense of the natural world, such that the flight of a hornbill becomes a curse of script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But by the time I got to uh, Sarawak in the late 80s, the sound of the forest unfortunately had become the sound of machinery. And I found myself in the midst of the highest rate of tropical deforestation on Earth. 
and the Penan were at the heart of it, and their homeland had been ravaged. And so rivers that once ran clear had become so laden with silt that it seemed as, as if half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea where the Japanese freighters were light on the horizon, ready to fill their holds with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Women suddenly brought into settlement camps as prostitutes and, and servants, children suffering from diseases, women astonished, men humiliated, eventually standing up in resistance, blowpipes against bulldozers, no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And when I was in Tibet uh, uh, five years ago, I got an email from a close friend who works with the Penan to let me know that the last of the nomadic Penan had been forced into the settlements. And so a way of life, morally inspired, inherently right, had literally been crushed within a generation in the time that I had known the people. And, and so what is actually causing the collapse of culture can be identified. Crude industrial intrusions that are not isolated alone to distant realms. This is my closest friend in, in Canada, uh, Oscar Dennis, a Taltan leader. And I must say when this photograph appeared in the National Geographic, women from around the world made a beeline to our fishing lodge in northern Canada. <laughs> Oz would call me up and say, wait, there's this chick from Poland coming to see me. I'd say, Oz, you just had someone from Moscow there last week. What are you talking about? He said, you know, you don't speak e Russian or Polish. They don't really come for conversation. <laughs> but, but Oscar and I have been fighting for years to protect an area called the Sacred Headwaters, where three of our great salmon rivers of British Columbia are born in the same meadows. And I won't, um, I won't go on about that environmental battle, but there are plans, and there were plans, to extract coal bed methane gas, anthracite coal, and, and open pit copper and gold mines. But what I want to just stress is that, you know, what is it that it takes in Canada to get a mine established? Well, you, you basically cobble together a company with less history than my dog. Um, you get online and secure the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the stories you've never heard. And as long as you can guarantee the government a flow of revenue, either in the form of taxation or royalties, you by definition secure the right to transform that place for all time. But what's fascinating from a cultural point of view, there's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the transformation of the wild that places any economic value on the land left alone or any cost to the commons, the rest of us who are not invested in that entity, uh, implicit in the destruction of that landscape. And we take that as a given because it's a way that we industrialize the wild. But viewed from the indigenous perspective, it's very strange. All the elders up there say to me, you know, what we should really do is bring these companies with all their families up to meet with us. And we'll put the children aside and the children will cut a deal. And for every drop of toxic waste that comes into our rivers, an equivalent drop of toxic waste will go into the rec center pool where their children recreate. For every tree cut down in our country, a rose bush will be cut down in that executive's wife's favorite rose garden in Vancouver. And this to the urban ear sounds ridiculous, but it's exactly what the native people, when they say, this is our garden, this is our kitchen. And one of the things to recognize is the way we view landscape and its transformation didn't come out of nowhere. It's rooted in a particular worldview that when Descartes said that all existed is mind and matter, in a single gesture he deanimated the world and swept away all instincts for myth, magic, and mysticism which had provided comfort for people, but also, in effect, took the world and turned it into a commodity ready to be exploited to the extent that by the 19th century, positive tradition said basically if phenomena could not be measured, they could not exist. And it's precisely this particular worldview that is assaulting the natural world. And it's a worldview that is not the norm as we maintain, it's actually the opposite of the norm. It's highly anomalous. And so I want to take you to the opposite extreme for a moment into the homeland of the Aboriginal people of Australia. Now, we know from studies of the Y chromosome that the ancestors of the Aboriginal people of Australia were the very first to walk out of Africa. In 5,000 years, they managed to get across the underbelly of Asia, cross the ocean waters that still separated New Guinea from Australia, and when they reached the most parsimonious of continents, they went walking. And over the course of generations, they established 10,000 clan territories, all of which are linked by a single idea, and that's the dreaming. And the dreaming's not a dream, it's a state of perpetual reality in which past, present, and future fuse perpetually into one. 
Now, when the British arrived in Australia, they saw people who looked strange, uh, who had a simple material technology. But what really offended the British about the Aboriginal people is that they showed no interest in improving upon their lot. And in their inimitable way, the British concluded that the Aborigines weren't people at all and began to shoot them. As it turned out, the reason the Aboriginal people did not improve upon the, their lot was because they had no interest in improving upon their lot. In fact, their entire ethos was not based on change at all. It was based on stasis. The entire purpose of life was to do nothing but the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world just as it was at the time of its creation. It would be as if all of um, human thought in the West had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now again, the issue is not to say who's right and who's wrong, but had humanity as a whole followed this particular intellectual tradition, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon, but we also wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biological life support systems of the planet. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia was there a word for past, present, or future. In not one was there a word for time. There was only the dreaming. And so if this industrial pressure can threaten culture, the other great culprit is ideology. And whether ideology is the cult of the modern or the cult of the Marxist-Leninist mania that swept over the, war, uh, the world in the wake of the fantasies of a German philosopher, which he distilled, of course, in the reading room of the British Library. This is a nun that I met in Angkor Wat, and you can see that her feet and hands have been severed from her body for the crime of pursuing her faith during the era of Paul Plot. This is a man I met in Cambodia, and it blew my mind. I met him last spring. What astonished me, I had visited Cambodia 12 times. I had never met anyone my age, because all my age cohort had been swept away in the killing fields. He only survived because as you can see, he lost his leg to a landmine. And if we go into Tibet, a place I spent a great deal of time, we'll come to understand what it meant when Mao Zedong, the Marxist materialist with a dubious distinction of having been responsible for the death of more of his own people in his lifetime than Hitler and Stalin combined, when he famously whispered in the ears of the 14th Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, His Holiness knew what to expect. In the wake of the final invasion of Lhasa, when the jackboot of the Chinese stepped upon the soul of a culture and to this day has never left, 1.2 million Tibetans killed for the religious faith, 6,000 temples and shrines torn apart and blasted from the air. I mean, think what it would mean to us if some foreign power came into the United States of America, declared all religion to be anathema, began to kill all those who pursued our religious traditions and then dismantled every physical structure in which we prayed. Well, this is exactly what happened in Tibet. And what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists with their cult of the modern? Well, Buddhism is distilled very simply in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He meant that shit happens. The second of the noble truths is that the cause of suffering was ignorance. By this, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and the most consequential was a delineation of a contemplative practice that, if pursued, had 2,500 years of empirical evidence to suggest that transformation of the human heart could in fact be achieved. And so when I made this film, The Science of the Mind, I traveled for two months with my good friend Mathieu Ricard, and as you can see here, it was rather like traveling through Sherwood Forest with Friar Tuck. <laughs> Mathieu had an incredible history. His father was France's most famous Descartian philosopher. He had written a two-volume history of Western philosophy from memory. His mother was a famous painter. If you can believe it, in their home in Paris, which was the abode of luminaries, Mathieu learned piano from Stravinsky. He learned um, photography from Henri Cartier-Bresson. He learned anthropology at the feet of Levi Strauss. He himself was studying molecular biology in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute when one day he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. And so he went back to the place he had always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. 
and with another friend of ours, a traditional Amstreet doctor, Shara Bama, seen here rather quizzically examining my urine sample, uh, we set off on a journey of the heart, to the very essence of the Buddhist doctrine. We went to Mount Everest under the guidance of Trusuk Rinpoche, head of the Nyingma tradition. We began at Shiwang, a monastery that clings like a swallow's nest to the edge of the mountains of, of Nepal. And then we participated in the 18-day in the ritual of the Mani Rimdu, which commemorates the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet by Guru Rinpoche in the 8th century. And then we began this great journey to Mount Everest, not to do what most Westerners do, climb to an elevation where oxygen deprivation alone obliterates consciousness, which from the Tibetan perspective is about the stupidest thing you could ever do. We went there not to bear witness to Western heroes, but to be in the presence of an Eastern hero, a woman who 45 years before had gone into solitary retreat, and for 45 years, day and night, she had simply recited a single mantra. As a young girl, she had been tremendously beautiful, but she wanted a religious life. Forced to become engaged with a wealthy merchant, she fled his clutches by crawling down a human latrine, covered by excrement. She went to the Tempelche Monastery. The lamas cleaned her up, dispatched her over the 23,000-foot Nangpala Pass. She became ordained as a Tibetan um, nun and then came back over the past and went into solitary retreat. And for 45 years, she had lived in a cell no bigger than the corner of the stage. And so en route, we paused in the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, had spent a full year in solitary retreat. And with Mathieu chanting the sutras, we made our way to the nunnery. And this next photograph was taken literally as a door opened onto the face of a woman. For the first time, the sunlight fell upon her skin in 45 years. You would have expected from the point of our view of our culture to have been greeted by a madwoman. Instead, the face that greeted us radiated loving compassion. And Mathieu later said to me, this is the proof of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And later that night, a lama said to me, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so it, even as the Tibetans continue to pursue the breath of the Dharma, they leave it to us to answer the question as to why it is that the international community continues to tolerate the wrath of China as it seeks to obliterate a tradition that has given so much to humanity. And so in the end, we really have a choice. What kind of world do we want to live in? Margaret Mead said before she died, her greatest fear was that as we drifted toward a blandly amorphous world culture, not only when the entire range of the human imagination be reduced to a single modality, but that we wake one day as from a dream, having forgotten there are other possibilities for life itself. The issue isn't the traditional versus the modern. It's the rights of free people to choose the components of our lives. It's not about freezing people in time any more than it's about us going back to a pre-industrial past. It's, it's how do we find a way that all peoples, all voices of humanity, can engage and benefit from the brilliance of modernity without that engagement having to demand the death of their ethnicity. And the reason that is so important and the central, in a way, message of this presentation is that culture is not decorative. It's not trivial. It's not the clothes we wear, the songs or prayers we utter. Ultimately, culture is about a body of moral and ethical values that every society places around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that lies beneath the surface of all of us. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find order and meaning in a universe that may have none, to do what Lincoln said, always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, when the individual by volition or coercion is cast adrift from the constraints and culture and comforts of tradition, often to find themselves in a world of alienation and disaffection, perhaps in the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, you just have to look at the points of chaos around the world. And not a week ago, I was in Kigali in Rwanda, and I took these photographs in the Genocide Museum. In a 100-day period, one million Tutsi murdered, chopped to death as a culture of that nation, precipitated, in a sense, by um, structures placed in motion by the colonizing powers of Belgium and Germany, 
literally um, descended into a nightmarish genocidal rage and mania. Culture is not trivial. It is a glue that holds civilization together. And nation states are finally recognizing that indigenous people do not embarrass a nation state. They enrich it if we're prepared to accept diversity. You know, Canada was never kind to the Inuit people in my childhood, uh, but now we have Nunavut. And when the British first arrived in the Arctic, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong, but one did more to dignify humanity. And what the British failed to understand was, was that there was no better measure of genius than the ability to, in, to survive in that harsh environment on a technology that was limited to what you could carve and, from stone and forge from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were originally made of fish, three Arctic char laid in a row and wrapped in the skin of a caribou hide. And when the British mimicked the ways of the Inuit, they achieved great feats of exploration, but mostly they failed to do so. And when the last of Lord Franklin's men were found dead at Starvation Cove, the young sailors were dragging behind them an iron and oak sled made in Manchester, England that weighed 500 pounds. On top of it was a dory from a ship that weighed 300 pounds, and inside the dory were all the accoutrements of a British naval officer's dinner service, including silver plate, and a copy of the novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. This they expected to drag through the immense boreal forests of Canada, hoping to bump into a Hudson Bay post and achieve salvation. But the Inuit, by contrast, moved lightly on the land. This is a photograph I took when I was polar bear hunting with them 250 miles out on the sea ice from Iglulik. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius before the wind came up, and we just made an igloo and crawled into the skins and lit the oil lamps. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. Despite what Greenpeace may tell you, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death, it's an affirmation of life itself. And when I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island once, I recorded a great story from Olayak, whose grandfather, during the Canadian dark period when we forced the Inuit into settlements, his, father categorically his grandfather categorically refused to go. And so fearful for his life, the family took away all of his weapons and tools, thinking that that would force the old man into the settlements. Uh, did it? No. In the middle of an Arctic night with a blizzard blowing, the man slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide and sealskin trousers, and defecated into his hand. As the feces began to freeze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. And when the implement, made from human waste, forged by the cold took final shape, he put a spray of saliva along the leading edge, and with that shit knife he killed a dog. He skinned the dog, improvised the traces of a sled with the skin of the dead dog, improvised the sled with the ribcage of the dead dog, harnessed up an adjacent living dog, and then shit knife and belt disappeared into the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. <laughs> but it's, it's a wonderful, a profical, example of the resilience of the Inuit people, a resilience that of course is now being sorely tested by something beyond their control. Finally, this is a photograph I took in the northernmost community in the Arctic, Kanak, in northwest Greenland, the only society that still uses dogs exclusively for hunting, and they are people of the ice. And the ice used to come in in September and go till July, now the ice doesn't form till November, and it's gone by March, so their world has been melted out from beneath them. And when I wrote this book, The Wayfinders, and the editors picked this subtitle, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World, it forced me to answer that question in the book. And I did so, of course, implicitly throughout the various lectures and the text, but in the end, it, I answered it with two words, climate change not to suggest that we go back to some pre-industrial past or to suggest that anybody on earth be kept from the genius of modernity, but rather to suggest that, that the very existence of these diverse voices of humanity, these other ways of being, put the absolute lie to those of us in our culture who say that we cannot change as we all know we must change the fundamental way that we interact with the natural world, because in the end, we need these voices. Everyone deserves a place at the council of human knowledge and wisdom, because each has something to say. And collectively, they become the prayers upon which the geography of hope is based. Thanks very much.
Thank you. You know, I know lots of you, um, I'm Irish, so I, you know, always speak too long. Lots of you have to get to lunch. I'm happy to answer questions or we can meet out at the books table or what would you like to do, Brett? Yeah, so there's a, a table with books just to the right and uh, there might be some opportunity to buy some books and for Wade to sign some of them. So um, hang around for that if you're interested. Thanks. I think people...